Okay. So, hello again, everyone. I am Ben Adams, mechanical engineer here in Martin's Geothermal Energy and Geofluids Group. Today, we're going to talk about this uh, CO2 power, geothermal power generation. So, this is different from the water power generation because you use CO2 both in the reservoir and uh, at the surface uh, th through all your pipes and through your equipment at the surface as well. So you replace water with uh, CO2 in a power cycle. This is, a, this is a little bit of an unusual power cycle. It's where I, I've spent most of my time. I did my PhD thesis on this. Um, it, there's advantages to doing it, but it hasn't been done yet in the world. Um, it's just something we see real potential for. So the emphasis I think so far for the class uh, is on water geothermal, like the information that I presented uh, last week and the equations that I presented. The, uh, this week I'm gonna talk about how we can adapt those a little bit for CO2 and what the advantages are. Um, but especially on the exam, the focus will be on the water geothermal, but we can apply all the same equations mostly to the CO2 power, the CO2 generation. So uh, for lecture today, we already covered the, uh, let's get my pointer here. We already covered the homework questions. We're gonna look at the, what happens when you, do, when you flow CO2 in a well bore instead of water, how that changes. CO2 has this uh, interesting thing called a thermosiphon generated pressure differential, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, we'll look at how our power loss, our, our pressure loss curves change when we use CO2 and how we can calculate the turbine power. So uh, what I expect of you on, on the exam questions, I have homework that is um, a fewer questions this week, but it's the same tune. Um, I'll expect you to understand why you would use CO2 instead of water as a geofluid, what the advantages are to that. Uh, I expect that you can estimate the CO2 densities from temperature and pressure. Um, this is using just a pH diagram, which I have in the slides here as well. So that's the one thing I expect you to be able to look up is a density from a pressure and temperature on a, on a, um, on a property plot. If you know there's some like a viscosity or something, I would give you that. I don't expect you to know that. So uh, I expect you to es estimate this thermosiphon generated pressure difference. I expect you to be able to tell what the mass flow rate is using uh, a given pressure difference from our characteristic pressure difference versus mass flow rate plots. Uh, I expect that you can calculate the CPG power using a thermal efficiency and also do a turbine power calculation. We'll talk about these things now. This is a figure from our a 2015 paper that we did where we plot power generation versus depth for several different types of geothermal plants. The uh, black ones are, are, are uh, CO2 direct geothermal plants or CPG power plants, and the uh, orange are our indirect brine systems, like the ones that we estimated last week. And so what you see here is that for sort of this range of, this intermediate range of depths, there's places where the CO2 power generation can be much greater than the water generated, uh, <laughs> than the power generated with water and indirect brine system. So uh, basically there's, there can be great advantages to using a, a CO2 power plant, or using CO2 as a geothermal working fluid. There's uh, two sort of, I guess, flavors of CPG plants. The dark the solid line is a pumped plant, a pumped CPG plant, and the dashed line is a thermosiphon plant. Basically without pumps, these CO2 plants generate their own circulation rate. They, um, fluid will circulate without pumping at all. And that's called this thermosiphon, this thermosiphon generated flow rate. And if you want to pump, you can usually get additional power. As you can see, the, the pump line is greater than the thermosiphon line. You can get more power out 
uh, but you don't have to. And today we're gonna focus on these, this thermosiphon system, this naturally convecting CO2 system. Here's another figure from our 2011 paper. Basically you have some sedimentary basin where CO2 has been sequestered as a part of CCS, so this effort to sequester CO2 to mitigate climate change. You capture CO2 from a coal plant or um, from directly from the air. You put it in a, in a sedimentary basin deep down in the earth. When it's down there, it gets hot. You can circulate this hot fluid back up to the surface, make power with it, and send the cold fluid, the cold CO2 back down. So it's a closed cycle, just like the water cycle was. The difference here is this is, you're circulating CO2 now and not water. CO2 just because of, it is what it is, it's properties, right? It has low, much lower viscosity than water, but a same heat capacity or a similar heat capacity. So the heat capacity it's abil is its ability to move heat from the reservoir out, but the viscosity tells you how, what the pressure losses are gonna be for it to do that. So you can move about the same heat out, but the pressure losses are lower, which just means you can, you lose less to losses and you can make more, make more power. So uh, CO2 is also compressible, which just is a fancy way of saying the density changes, right? Water is incompressible because the density is, we assume it's constant. Because the density of CO2 changes, you get this thermosiphon effect, which reduces your need for pumps, although you still can't do it. CO2 is also different from water uh, because its solubility is different. So a lot of the thing, uh, salts that can dissolve into water, say, just don't dissolve into CO2. So you don't carry those salts up to the surface. CO2 has its own set of problems, but uh, uh, we offer some relief in, in that department. So here's a map showing the sedimentary basins for, that are targeted for CO2 storage. The left is a map from the United States Geologic Survey, which did a big comprehensive study of all these CO2 storage sites in the US. And on the right, we have uh, a, a world map that shows storage sites as well. And basically, the point here is that, you know, there's these basins that are maybe a third or half of the, of the US, and they're available everywhere. In the US, the technical storage capability for CO2 in these saline aquifers is something like 3,000 gigatons of CO2. And just for comparison, you know, the US or the European Union generate about five gigatons per year. So there's many uh, years worth of CO2 storage, even if we were just to put all the CO2 we generate now into the ground. So these things, these reservoirs are, are going to be used for CO2 storage. You're gonna have a bunch of CO2 in the ground at some point in the future here. So CO2, uh, geothermal can utilize that. So this, uh, uh, this is a comparison between this direct CO2 system that I'm talking about today and this indirect water system like we talked about last week. In the indirect water system, you have some you know, reservoir filled with water. You bring that water up to the surface with a downhole pump. You uh, take the heat out with a secondary power cycle at the surface and then you re-inject the water. So uh, in this case, we need this downhole pump to keep the water from flashing when it was produced to the surface, right? We didn't talk about this secondary, you know, this, the secondary loop too well. This is just that the heat engine at the surface that's removing heat from the geofluid and making electricity. The difference is when you have a direct CO2 system now, you have this whole reservoir is now filled with CO2. You bring that hot CO2 up to the surface. Be, uh, just because uh, CO2, the density can change, you end up with a pressure differential between your wellhead, your production wellhead at four and your injection wellhead at one. There's just a pressure differential that occurs that I'll talk about next. And you can use that then to power a turbine. So you can directly run your CO2 that you brought to the surface through a turbine and make electricity to it. Then you gotta pay the piper here, right? You gotta just vent the waste heat to the atmosphere and then you can re-inject it. So if you have a pump, you would put it here at the surface uh, for a CPG system, but the thermosiphon system we're talking about today doesn't have a pump here either. Just the, 
it CO2 comes out of the condenser as a liquid and it's just re-injected down the well. A comparison of the um, CO2 in water, geologic CO2 in water. So the CO2 will have lower viscosity than water. So I've just picked two conditions here. I picked 100 C water and 15 C water. 250 bar would be the pressure, hydrostatic pressure in a 2.5 kilometer uh, reservoir. And one bar is just atmospheric, right? So this is the viscosity of these two versus the viscosity at CO2 at those two conditions. And generally the viscosity is like an order of magnitude greater for water uh, than it is for CO2. And the density, um, CO2 has lower density than water, but it can be close, right? So at 150 C, you have about 550, 590 kilograms per cubic meter. At 15 C uh, and lower, lower pressure, you can have 820 in water. We always just assume is 1,000, right? So uh, this density changes a lot. And these both then affect the mass flow rate of the system. So if you have lower viscosity, you have lower friction losses. So you have a higher mass flow rate. Your pressure difference that you impose with a pump or whatever is gonna just generate a higher mass flow rate. Uh, yeah. And the, uh, the uh, density then has the effect of generating the thermosiphon effect, which also increases the mass flow rate. So if you were to calculate the power of a CPG system, this is um, an, a, a slide adopted from last week. So you have the CPG system. There's two ways you can do it. You can actually simulate the power cycle. So you can say the net power to the grid. There's only two things. It's the, turb it's the power that you generate with a turbine minus the, the pumping work that you do. And of course, other parasitic loads like minus the the you know, the, the energy it takes to run your cooling towers, right? Um, but we'll assume this is just zero for today. Or you can use this, just our old friend from last week, you can use the thermal efficiency times the heat produced. This also works just for CO2 power generation, right? It's just a heat engine, just the same. You would have the heat produced from the ground using the CO2 as the mass flow rate of the, of the of circulation of the CO2 times the specific heat of CO2 uh, times your temperature difference. But this thermal efficiency, you know, you could calculate the Carnot efficiency or 20% Carnot and do that just the same. So let's look how the mass flow rate would change uh, using method two for estimating power generation. So this, uh, this system is like last week, the same, we're using these same equations from last week. You have a a closed loop filled with CO2 where you circulate CO2 from a reservoir up to the surface. That's with some mass flow rate. There's losses that occur in the production well, in the injection well, and within the reservoir. And these losses, the pipe losses and the, and the reservoir losses are equal to the, the pumping that you do on the system. So uh, this is the same Darcy Weisbach pressure loss pipe pressure loss equation from last week, and this is the same Darcy flow reservoir loss equation from last week. So the difference with CO2 is that the um, the density of the fluid causes a second sort of pumping pressure. It generates a pumping pressure called a thermosiphon pressure difference that is a lot like a pump, except it's not actually a you know, a piece of equipment that you install. It's just the physics doing the pumping for you. And so if we don't have a pump, there's basically this pressure difference imposed by the thermosiphon, which is then equal to your losses in your system. So this, um, this thermosiphon pressure difference is, was also, um, also occurs with water, but it's much, much, much lower. And so we basically neglect it. So let's talk about this thermosiphon pressure differential a little bit. All right, so here's just a cartoon that I have between a reservoir that's 2.5 kilometers deep and a surface that's 15 degrees Celsius. And the reservoir is 100 degrees Celsius. The pressure in this reservoir is 25 megapascal. 
In this example, I'm assuming a quasi-static flow, which means the flow rate in the whole system is zero, but the temperatures haven't stabilized yet. So it's like, you know, just you, you turned off, you turned off the valve and the whole flow, the whole system just stopped. But the, the production well is still filled with hot fluid and the injection well is still filled with cold fluid. You know, with time, right, the cold well would get heat from the surroundings and the hot well would cool off. But this is still where, you know, the flow rate is just, um, it's just stopped, but everything's still hot. So there's no pressure losses anywhere. The reservoir is all 25 megapascal. So because this well is hot, just it's going to have a, the average density more or less in the well is going to be low because CO2 just has a lower density with a higher temperature. And the density in the injection well where the fluid's cold is going to be higher. If we use this, uh, the Bernoulli equation that we uh, also talked about last week, the pressure at the top is the pressure at the bottom plus the sort of effective uh, density in the well times G times our uh, change in depth. So in this case, in last week it didn't matter because this density was always a thousand, but this week uh, with CO2, the density changes. So you get, so this change between top and bottom is different between the, in the production well and the injection well. So in the production well with this density at the surface, you get 10 megapascal. In the injection well, with the same downhole pressure, but with a higher density, you get a lower pressure at the surface. So between two and three, you see there's, the pressures aren't the same, there's a difference, right? This thermal siphon pressure is the difference between the pressures at two and three, which you can just, um, which you can just calculate from the density difference in the injection and production well. This pressure difference then you can use to drive a turbine at the surface, or you can you know, just use it to circulate fluid. So that's this thermal siphon pressure difference. In this example I've shown here, the pressure difference is 5.6 megapascal between these two. So how do you calculate the, the density in these different wells? The injection well density is different, is easy. This is um, a pH diagram, pressure, pressure versus enthalpy for CO2. Basically, our injection state, we always want to inject liquid, liquid CO2. So we just assume it's saturated liquid. So it's on this dark line over here, up to the critical point. This is the saturated liquid line. So if you want to find the density at a temperature that we inject at, so 15C is, here's the, these are the temperature lines, 10, 20, 0. So 15C would be here. The saturated liquid is this point. The densities are these dashed lines up over here. So the density there's a little greater than 800, so 815 or so. Then the, uh, um, the production well density then, you have to basically calculate from the reservoir, the reservoir temperature and pressure. using the reservoir temperature and pressure. The reservoir pressure will always just assume is hydrostatic. So it's 100 bar or 10 megapascal per kilometer. And the production and the reservoir temperature is whatever it is, right? So if the reservoir temperature is 120 C and it's two kilometers deep, that's gonna be this 20 megapascal line, 200 or 120 Celsius. So this 120 isotherm, 120 should be this line. So this is 120, 20 megapascal. The density here is about 400 would be the density in the production well. So that's how you calculate the injection well and production well densities. The densities in the injection and production well change, right? That's what CO2 does is the density changes all the time. But just for simplification, just what we're doing now, just we're going to say the, the density in the production well is whatever it is coming out of the reservoir. And the density in the injection well is just a saturated liquid. Hey, I have a question. Great. Um, yep. Is, um, would it be helpful for us to have a pH diagram in front of us? 
yeah, so you almost certainly will. So I would just recommend these slides. Um, okay. I guess, you know, if you want to print one out, you can, but I, and at the end of this PowerPoint deck, I just put a blank one of these two. So you'll, you'll need it. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so then uh, your mass flow rate. So these are the same two equations from last time. We're gonna neglect pump losses for now. So this thermal siphon pressure difference is equal to the losses in the pipe in the reservoir. This, um, this pressure loss versus mass flow rate plot, the solid lines are from last time um, for this 2.5 kilometer deep reservoir. The solid line, this is the total pressure loss for the pipe and the reservoir these two and the blue line is just for the pipe the it's just for the pipe and the solid lines are for water the dashed lines are for co2 so this just shows us how the pressure loss in the whole system changes as a function of mass flow rate so you can see first of all when switching from water to co2 for a fixed flow rate the the pipe losses are actually greater for co2 just because you have density down here in the bottom. So if the density decreases as it does for CO2, just the top gets larger, the pressure losses get larger. So for the same flow rate, the CO2 pipe losses get larger. But uh, the reservoir, because you have this ratio of a viscosity to density, the viscosity of CO2 is you know, an order of magnitude less. So this reservoir pressure loss gets less. So uh, our total loss here at 40 kilograms per second, our total pipe losses are less for CO2 than water, even though the, the total losses are less for CO2 than water, even though for the pipe, the CO2 was greater, right? And it turns out for a geothermal system, right, you can, you can choose the pipe size you want. You can always put in a bigger pipe, but the reservoir you know, properties like permeability and thickness these are things that you can't choose. So we'd rather be able to, we'd rather choose the piping instead. So in this example that I calculated before, this thermal siphon generated pressure difference is 5.6 megapascal that I um, calculated on the last slide. So uh, if you have that 5.6 megapascal, which acts like a pump, right, you would end up, you would, it intersects the total pressure loss curve here at about 17 kilograms per second. So if you just had a wild system here, we just circulated CO2 and you just removed heat at the surface and let the whole thing circulate, you get about 17 kilograms per second of circulation just without any pumping at all. So with this, uh, which is pretty cool. So you have to use this, this pressure difference, this 5.6 megapascal, you can use it for two things. You can use it either to circulate fluid or you can run it through a turbine and generate power from it. So we can just assume that half of it is used to circulate flow and half of it is used to power a turbine. So half of that 5.6 megapascals is 2.8. Um, so, so if you use 2.8 megapascals to circulate the flow, that's going to be that's going to intersect the total pressure loss line around here, which is about 12 kilograms per second. And then you can use the other 2.8 megapascal to generate power in a turbine, which I'll talk about next. And of course, if you want to pump this system, if you want to add a pump, right, you can always increase the pressure losses above five. You know, if you pump it 15, you know, you're going to get 35 kilograms per second out. So, uh, and because this pump is at the surface and not a downhole pump with CO2, there's actually no limit uh, to how much you can pump. So you can circulate as much as you want. It becomes an optimization problem, which is beyond what we need to talk about here. Okay, so I talked about the mass flow rate for, uh, for a CO2 system now and how that's different.
Uh oh, sorry about that. I see uh, you couldn't hear me now. Uh, can someone tell me? I hit, accidentally hit the mute on my microphone. Can someone tell me when the last what the last thing they heard was? Just the first part of this um, slide. Of this slide? Okay. So we calculated, I was showing how you can calculate mass flow rate. Um, the mass flow rate using CO2 instead of water. But you, uh, that was for method two for finding the power generation of a cycle. Method one is always the more exact, which is just to calculate, you know, actually simulate the system and calculate the power generation directly by calculating what the pump power is, what the pump power is and what the turbine power are and, you know, subtracting them. So I'm going to talk for a minute about this turbine power generation. In a direct system, the turbine is right here at the surface. It's you produce the fluid, the CO2, right? It's four is at a higher pressure than one. So the pressure, uh, you know, the, the pressure, we don't have a pump. So the pressure all through here is basically the const is constant. So you have some pressure differential between four and five. The power, the power, of a turbine is the mass flow rate of the turbine times the isentropic efficiency of the turbine times the integral of dp over rho. This pressure difference is between four and five. If we assume constant density, we can simplify this. It's not really a constant density because, because it changes, but we can just say it's this, um, it's an effective density through the turbine. And for this example, we'll just assume it's equal to the density of four which is the density of the fluid going into the turbine. So uh, we calculate mass flow rate. The th turbine efficiency is about 80%. Uh, we can calculate the rest of this here. Yeah, so we can solve this guy. The mass flow rate was 12 kilograms per second. The efficiency of the turbine is 80%. Um, the pressure difference, I say now it's 2.8 megapascal because I used half of that to drive the flow to create this mass flow rate, and I use the other half now to generate power with, with the turbine. You know, this is another optimization that I don't expect you to be able to do at all. Um, but you know, you could you could use more of this pressure difference to drive the flow, and then have a lower delta p here. It's a trade-off, and you find just which one is generates the most power. But here we'll assume it's half. Then the only thing left remaining is this effective density going through the turbine. That effective density, we'll look that up from a pH diagram. All right. In, need, in, in order to know this, you need to know what the wellhead pressure and temperature are. What's the temperature and pressure at state four? We know already before we solved the pressure was 10 and a half megapascal, but we don't know what the temperature is. And the temperature of CO2 changes as it goes up a well which is interesting because for water, you basically assume the temperature doesn't change and only the pressure decreases. But CO2, both the pressure and the temperature decrease as it goes up a well. And that's explained here. As, it, as the CO2 rises up the well, it gains potential energy. It, uh, it increases the potential energy, which it gets, which is sort of robs from its pressure or enthalpy, um, its internal energy as well. So uh, the enthalpy of the fluid decreases as it goes up a, up a well. So if we start down here in a reservoir, a two kilometer reservoir at some temperature, say 130 in this example, 130 C, as it comes up a well, it follows a line of constant entropy. That's these little S guys here. It's isentropic, which means it's a perfect process, expansion process. As it comes up the well, the enthalpy down here decreases, it goes from left or right to left. Uh, so it decreases as it comes up the well and it reduces in pressure. So you can see the temperature drops. So it goes 130, 120, 110 as it comes up the well. The density decreases, goes from 400 to 300 towards 200, right? And the, the, and the, so the, the temperature and the pressure drops. The temperature in this case ends up to be about 60. So just, just this is a, an example of how the temperature decreases as CO2 comes up the well, both the temperature and pressure decrease. For our cases, we found, I found that the CO2 
geothermal temperature decreases by about a factor of 15 Celsius per kilometer. Just rule of thumb that'll work for us here. So it loses about 15 C per kilometer during, uh, due to expansion in the production well. So for a 100 C kilometer, a 100 C reservoir 2.5 kilometers deep, uh, we expect the temperature decrease to be about 37 degrees and a wellhead temperature then of 63. If you plot that on this plot, we know that the temperature at the surface is 10 and a half megapascal. The, the, the pressure at the surface is 10 and a half megapascal. The pressure is 63 Celsius. Those temperature and pressure are here on this plot. And then the density for that is about 300. So in this example for this turbine, the density going into the turbine is about 300 kilograms per cubic meter. And that's what we can expect in the system. So that's this guy, 300 kilograms per cubic meter. That was the last piece we needed. The turbine power is just the, uh, this calculation here, which ends up being about 90 kilowatts in this example that I've chosen. So that was kind of the long way to describe the toughest thing to get here was the density going through the turbine. So then if you know what the turbine power is, you know what the power for the whole system is basically. So we've covered the calculation of net power using each of these different methods. On the exam, I expect that you'll be able to do this turbine power calculation just given uh, uh, the properties like I just worked through uh, right now. And you'd probably have to look up the density on the chart. Or you can calculate the CPG using this way, which is really just the same as last week, except the, the mass flow rate has a different curve. So you, ha uh, you get a different mass flow rate. And the CP is for water and not or for CO2 and not water. That is uh, what I have for today. I have a homework set that has there's less problems. Some is a repeat from last week, but recalculating with CO2 instead of water. So just see how comfortable you are with doing that. And for calculating this thermosiphon generated pressure difference. Does anyone have any questions about some slides or things that were confused on today they'd like me to re-explain? Um, I have a question. If we solve the exercises from today and we do not get any any solutions, can we uh, text you by mail or, or how can we get sure that what we've done is correct or not? Yeah, cool. If you want to send me an email, that is that is just fine. Um, I, I think I sent out an email to the class announcing this lecture, so just write me an email uh, if you need some explanation and I'll be glad to uh, get you a solution. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Of course. Well, good. I'm going to end the recording now.